Well, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to today's discussion. I'm Tom Vick, curator of film at the National Museum of Asian Art. Our guest today is Sanjay Suri. She's a British Indian writer director based in London. A graduate in pure mathematics, she received a scholarship for, uh, to study documentary at the National Film and Television School. Her feature documentary, Eye for India, premiered at the World Competition section of the Sundance Film Festival, screened at over 20 international festivals, and garnered several awards before being released theatrically to critical acclaim in the UK and the US. And it was that film that led to her being uh, commissioned by the British Film Institute to work with their uh, collection of films shot in India between 1899 and 1947, and encouraged to work creatively with that material to create the film she created, which is around India with a movie camera. So please welcome Sanja Suri. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, I guess I'll just start with a question about, um, you know, you had... I think over a hundred hours of footage to work with, right? So how did you sort of sort it all out and come up with an approach to making this film? Well, originally the idea was that the BFI were going to sort of do a pre-select for me. Um, but actually when I started looking at the footage um, and the footage was very, very disparate, I said, I wanted to look at everything myself. I just felt I needed to engage with understand everything that existed in the archive, which was, you know, a bit crazy, but I did watch about 140 hours. Wow. And there were various, a very, very wide ranging collections. So there are home videos, I mean, home films. Um, there are institutional films, educational films, um, sort of semi-fictionalized films. And from all different types of bodies and all different types of collections. And I was trying to figure out, well, God, this is, you know, crazy footage. All I knew when I was watching it was that I felt so incredibly excited by it. But then I thought, look, I'm going to the BFI. I'm going to have to say something really smart about, you know, you know what my approach is. Like I'm going to go backwards from partition or I'm going to do A to Z or I don't know, something. And I, and I, and I just thought I don't have a really clever concept to structure this. So I just went to the meeting and I said, you know, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to, I'm just going to watch the footage and I'm going to make this, I'm going to see what the resonances are between the materials. Cause that's the joy of editing. I'm going to see where, what the repeated themes are and, and and where the contradictions are. And I'm just going to sort of make note of that and, and let the film form organically. And, and that was like probably the best decision I made and most enjoyable way to approach your footage as well. Yeah. It's very, it's not exactly linear. I mean, it's partially linear, but it's definitely more of a, um, I guess, experimental approach to this footage. So, and, and did anything kind of surprise you as you were looking through this footage or, or I mean, wh what was your general impression of, uh, of what you found? I mean, some of it was really um, shocking, mm. um, but not surprising. Right. Um, the, I, think, I think the footage that I found most um, surprising or that touched me the most were actually the home, the, the Super 8 films. Mm. Um, from the from the British who were there because that was something I'd really never seen before. Mm. Mm. You know, the condescending views of India is sort of be what you expect, and then some of it's much more shocking, like the Salvation Army footage, which is really, you know, really disturbing. Yeah. But, but some of it, yeah, some of it, the, the the man who shoots the fakirs who do these crazy body, you know, performances, the right. acts. Um, things like that were probably the biggest surprise. Oh, okay. And what, what was the reason that, uh, I mean, was there a particular reason why we sort of stop at partition? Was that um, a, a choice on your part or was it uh, on BFI or what, what, uh, how did that work? That's just up until where the footage is, basically. There, was, there wasn't really much footage after that because the British, I suppose, were no longer recording and um, they'd left. And then we didn't have access to any but the BFI didn't, doesn't have any much from the Indian collections. So it wasn't like a collaboration with an Indian archive. So I had what, what I had, which was a natural, a natural ending point, was it, which was a British departure from India. I see. And um, yeah, I mean, and it's interesting how you kind of balance. I mean, obviously there was this, you know, colonialist attitude and a lot of the, the footage is kind of, you know, exoticizing things. And, but I think you kind of managed to balance out and not 
make too kind of strong a statement about that. I think it really is a, is a, it, so you're conscious of that as a decision that you didn't want to just make it a film about how terrible the British were, uh, you know, as colonial uh, uh, leaders of the country. I mean, how did you approach that issue without kind of taking it too, too far, I guess? Well, I mean, I think that's, that's pretty evident anyway. So there's no need to work on that in the film. You know, <laughs> right. that that's, that's not really something I would, I would make as a statement. But I think for me, it was about, um, it was a lot about the evolving relationship between the British and the Indian. So, you know, there were certain th themes that remained. So there was the, for example, the constant fascination and romanticization of the, of the Maharajas in particular that started from when they arrived and continued until when they left. You know, they were just so, right. so in love with the, with the image of the Maharaja and that, that romance of it. But there was a big shift from, you know, the beginning where a lot of the films were about sort of pomp and ceremony and authority and, and emphasizing that status to, to sort of exploring and conquering and moving around India and, and, and observing the Indians to then later a sort of a more nuanced relationship begins to mm. develop, especially as we approach the Second World War and Indians, you know, enlisted to fight and the idea of partition becomes something. And then, you know, then I even at the end of the film reverse that gaze and have the Indians, the BBC commenting on, on the British and how they live. Mm -hmm. And then towards the very end of the film, you know, I actually just, I think it's a penultimate shot is of, a, of the Indians, Indians and, and, and Englishmen sharing a meal together. And for me, that was really important to, to show that the relationship was, was deeply complex between mm. ruler and ruled. It's not, it's not a simple relationship. Mm. But at the same time, I mean, I think the very act of the BFI choosing a British Asian filmmaker to come and review this archive is in itself, you know, deeply political. And, and the whole time, the fact that I am remaking meaning of these films, which have very different intentions, is 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 what's interesting, you yeah. know, and radical actually, really. Yeah, yeah, that is. So, so were you the first filmmaker approach to to do this to kind of like go into the archive and create something that wouldn't be a straightforward documentary, or is this something that they do? No, they do sometimes. They sort of head hunt a few particular people, depending on what the archive is. Mm -hmm. um, I think they've got something that they're doing now with their Japan collection at the minute. Right. I don't know um, exactly what, but yeah, they've done, they've done this a few times. Okay. And uh, the, the footage, for some reason, that seems to strike a lot of people, including me, is very interesting, is this, this uh, kerosene can factory documentary, which for some reason is uh, kind of mesmerizing. So, I mean, uh, so, and, and you, you definitely kind of emphasize it. So I was wondering if you could talk about more about that film. It was, and it's one of the only Indian filmmakers' work, right? Exactly. I mean, yeah. And a great Indian, a great Indian yeah. filmmaker. And I think for me, what I love about it is not only is it really beautiful um, and done with so much craft and so much skill, um, but I love the fact that everything is so exoticized and, and, then, and then the Indian comes in and he just makes something so beautiful just about tins. <laughs> right. so we need to put that in the middle of, you know, the, the temples and the Hindu gods and, you know, all this, yeah. all this gaze of the, the colonials um, to, this, to this really sort of matter of fact but deeply inherently poetic film about tins. Yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad you responded to that. <laughs> I'm not sure everybody's going to love this. It, I, yeah, there's something about it that really, I don't know, it just is, sort of resonates. And I also noticed in a lot of the press coverage, people kind of point that out too. I guess it is because it is so different from all of this other sort of British film stuff that emphasizes uh, their superiority or the exoticism of the country they're in. And here is this, you know, very unique footage of this, you know, seemingly kind of boring factory, but it really isn't. It's really kind of, you know, what, like you said, well-crafted and, and beautifully done. So maybe if you could talk about, as I mentioned in the beginning, you were um, uh, brought into this project because of your first film, I From India, which you constructed, uh, also have found footage, but from films that your father made, uh, home movies, when the family moved to England. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between these two projects. One, obviously, very personal, 
one kind of taking on this huge chunk of history. Uh, what was it like working in those two different modes? Well, I for India was a film that was made, like you said, from footage that my father and my family made. Um, but what was particular about that film was that basically when my father had arrived in England in the 60s, he decided to document his life here. Um, but it, it was mainly also about a mode of communication. So he decided that, you know, the phone was really bad and the telegrams were terrible and letters took too long. So he bought, you know, two sets of film equipment and set one to India and kept the other in England. And we communicated through films, film letters for 40 years. So, I mean, what was interesting about that film is that, like any sort of home archive, is that you have, you know, a real strong body of of, of films, which has its own narrative, which is quite clear. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it might be very difficult to choose and, and, and there is a craft to how you form that. But, um, you know, there are characters, there are characters and there's a storyline. Whereas in the Around India footage, because it was so disparate, it was about, it was just about being a lot more playful and a bit more fluid and leaving the audience some space to actually themselves want to go and, you know, make connections or, you know, leaving more space for the audience, I feel, rather than trying to, you know, push a sort of emotion, even though I hope there is, I hope there is an emotional arc at some level to, to Around India. Mm, yeah, I mean, I think there definitely definitely is. Yeah. Oh, we're starting to get some questions. So, um, if you if you'd like, I can just read them to you, so you don't have to divide your attention. Oh, yeah. But, um, yeah. Uh, first question: It was a great film, very disturbing and compelling in equal measure. Uh, can you talk about the decision to now use captions identifying the locate? No, not use captions identifying the locations or subjects in any given clip. Ah. Oh, um... To be honest, that wasn't that wasn't I said that wasn't really a, a conscious decision. Um, I mean, sometimes we didn't know where the places were or who the people were for a start, so we didn't always have that information. When we did have it, for example, the missionary um, and the missionary footage from nineteen oh four, then then we then we'd put it in. But essentially, I was more interested in. Um, and the BFI, I think, were more interested in communicating, you know, certain facts about the archive. For example, that that really stunning footage at the beginning of, uh, which are, which are stenciled, which are stenciled in colour, you know, mm, so yeah. just just giving information about that. And and I mean, I really, really wanted to find out a lot about the people who'd done the home footage, you know, when they died mm. and who they were and who remained and, you know, but it was just incredibly difficult and there weren't the resources to really dig into those stories and find out, you know, sometimes people just leave collections with the BFI with a little note and they don't know anymore. They just have a load of, you know, a load of films and that's it. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, And the next question, I think uh, you can probably answer very easily. Who got the Benares location wrong? Was it miscatalogued for 100 plus years? This is for people who don't know early, some of the early footage is, is labeled as being in Calcutta, but is actually in uh, Varanasi. And this was discovered, I guess, in the process of going through the footage and making the film. Um, and it was not, I guess, uh, mis uh, cataloged by the archive, but by the company that made it, am I correct? Yeah, by yeah. the company that made it, the Warwick yeah. Trading Company. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that, that was known for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. But only discovered uh, in the process of making the film. Well, maybe could you talk a little bit about how you structured it in terms of the time frame, like you, you, it's basically linear, but you do skip around a bit. So what made you decide to not kind of like go 1899 to 1947? What, what made you sort of make it more imp- impressionist, I guess, in that way? Well, I, I, I do. It is roughly chronological, like you right. said, but some of it was just, you know, just making a, so just making the associations with, with, with things which, you know, work the best. So, so, you know, having the, having the missionary footage, but then, you know, very shortly after having, having this incredibly exotic film about, from Jack Cardiff about, you know, Hinduism and the temples and, right. you know, the strange, the Hindu, and to show that at the same time they're converting, they're, they're, you know, there's just this con- constant contradiction, you know, they're, they're equally fascinated. 
Mm. So it was about, a lot of it was about highlighting those contradictions. So mm. that's how mm. I sort of looked at the footage. Right, right. And at yeah. the moment, there were little sequences where I wanted to build certain ideas. For example, um, you know, I have this sequence with, you know, with a wonderful score from, from Shumik where I was really trying to play in this idea of the, of the Brits exploring and expanding and conquering. And I just have them sort of climbing and, you know, going through grass and climbing up mountains and being dragged up hills and, you know, just ascending to this idea of, okay, we're here, you know, we're going to conquer it, you know? So, <laughs> so certain things were about, were about focusing on, on those type of ideas, basically, and right. working with, with a score to do that. Yeah, I love this idea of the, the, the struggling English as this metaphor for them kind of struggling in India, that you have all this footage of them you know, trying to climb things and all that. I think that's a very clever. Yeah, and they are, and they're, they're doing it, but they're, you know, they're also you know, getting up so ungracefully onto an elephant. <laughs> right, yeah. A <laughs> couple more questions here. And sp speaking of uh, Schumick, uh, could you discuss the scoring? I wondered what kind of discussions you had with the composer and what sort of texture you hoped the music would give to the footage. Mm. Well, actually, it was um, a really crazy um, collaboration in that Shumik was so, so busy doing lots of other things that we had very little dialogue early on in the process. And it was quite late when Shumik came up with the, with the score. Um, and at that stage, and I had sort of expressed to him certain idea. I mean, he'd, I'd waited for him first to come, you know, he'd watch the footage and he said, well, what I feel I need to do is make music which which has this sort of sense of unease about it which is discordant in some way um so so you know we he played with that basically and mm. and and some i mean we had a very interesting discussion about the end of the film because he had automatically done a very you know the end of the film was about the british leaving and you know i had this really brilliant blue sea and this sort of sense of liberation. And Schumacher had done something very upbeat and sort of soaring. And I said, you know what? I think that actually it's a little bit more complicated than that. I think the end of the film should be, you know, let's end the film on more of a note of a question, a question mm. about what is the legacy of the British? What will India be? How mm. will, you know, how, how, you know, how will things, how will things be going forward? And because the last shot is at this, man and a little baby getting up and rising up and standing and I thought that was you know perfect footage for it and I and I was really happy with the discussions I had with Shumik about ending it more yeah. on a question. Interesting and you also I understand did a, a, a live version of the score you did a he performed with the film he at some did. point? Is it, yeah, yeah I haven't seen it so I haven't oh, okay. seen it I mean a shorter oh. cut a oh. slightly shorter cut for that yeah. Oh okay uh, another question, other than the one clip of uh, Gekwar of Baroda turning his back on George V, didn't see any footage of rebellion or resistance. Is this because this footage doesn't exist or were they purposely left out? That's an interesting question. No, the only thing I have is from the um, American newsreel of the British, um, the British Luffy charging the, um, a crowd. Um, and we do have Gandhi in the Salt March. Right. Um, so it was, there wasn't, there wasn't a great deal. There was, an, that was what I had from the newsreels and that was, yeah, both American. That's what, that's what we put in. Is that, I mean, maybe you don't know this, but was, is that because the British media was purposefully, you know, not covering any kind of rebellious activity in order to keep it sort of hidden? I mean, is that, did you have a sense of that or is it just maybe the, the randomness of what ends up in an archive? Well, I wonder why they would document that. Yeah, you know. yeah. Who would be documenting that? For what purpose? True. So maybe it doesn't exist. Right. Yeah, that may be true. Uh, another question. Um, have you ever seen the French, possibly French documentary shown in art film houses in the 60s called Phantom India? Uh, at the time I found oh, it. Yeah. yeah. Long yeah. time ago. Ah, okay. And the, the person says, at the time I found it disorienting to my Midwestern Western mind. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on Phantom India? <laughs> Oh, I really can't remember. It was so long ago. <laughs> yeah. Ah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> that's one I need All to right. track down as well. <laughs> I should, I should, but that's, that's sort of, you know, back at film school, I remember watching that. And right. 
I've got lockdown memory mush right now, probably. <laughs> as, as we all do. <laughs> uh, do you want to talk about other projects that you're, well, hopefully working on or maybe working on or have done since this, uh, this last film? Yeah, well, um, I basically made a slight shift to do towards fiction to try and there were some stories I wanted to tell that I just found documentary wasn't, wasn't the right vehicle for. So I wrote a feature script that I, um, I got onto the Sundance labs with, which was brilliant. Mm. And, um, and I did a sh my first short, um, fiction, uh, two years ago in India, at the same time I was doing around India with a movie camera. I did a, I did it my first short fiction, which is called the field. Um, which is also shot in India. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, another question, a uh, small question. Do you know why the Salvation Army asked the Indian woman to remove her jewelry? It was such painful footage. That was that is some of the footage that really does stand out, that, that sequence. So, But yeah, why was the Salvation Army doing this? Well, it was the evangelical, you know, that mission, that's, that's, that's what they did. But, mm. And... and I think what's interesting about that footage, along with other footage in it, is that obviously this is all a fiction, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I'm not sure they would make women take off their, they probably would do, but not in that theatrical fashion in which it's done for the film. So I find it sort of interesting to think about, you know, I mean, some, you know, some of the footage is documentary, but some of the footage is so staged, I often wondered throughout, making this film about what were they telling? What were they telling this woman, you know, about why that, you know, why they were shooting this and mm -hmm. what it was for and, you know, what does she, what does she understand? And some, you know, some of the other footage when they shot that lion and tiger fight, for example, you know, they say such horrible things about the, uh, the men who help with the, with the, with the hunting. And and yet they you know they're standing in front of camera and they're they're smiling so innocently and the intention is so disturbing behind mm -hmm. what the filmmaker want wants to do. So for me as a documentary maker watching that, um, even the footage that Jack Cardiff shot of of the dancing girls uh, accompanying the Maharaja on the dusty Indian road, I'm thinking that can't be a, you know, that can't be a real thing. <laughs> right. you know, who, who sets this up? In what way? And you know what's told? You know we want to do this. I mean, I just wondered how many questions were asked by by the people who were filmed. Probably not many. You know. Right. Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. Well, uh, while we're waiting for other questions, I have one that's kind of out of left field, but it's a more general question. But when I read that you studied uh, uh, at mathematics before going into filmmaking. Uh, when I was in film school, one of my professors went on a similar journey where he studied mathematics and then became a filmmaker. And it definitely in sort of informs his work. And I'm wondering if you feel that mathematics uh, influences your filmmaking in any way, or if you've abandoned uh, that field entirely. Well, I mean, I studied pure maths, which is pretty out there, you know, and <laughs> so, so it is, you know, strange things, you know, trying to prove over 20 pages why one plus one equals two and things like that. <laughs> um, I think, I think I do, I think I do have a very um, structured mind. Mm. Um, so for me, like being in an edit in a documentary and building and forming structure and, and making connections, um, is, 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 is what I really enjoy doing. So I suppose in some way that could be mathematical, maybe. I think, it, yeah, it maybe would be helpful in trying to organize this vast amount of footage into like, you know, uh, into something that you can work with. I would see a math background helping with that. Well, yeah, um, but this, on this one, it really wasn't. In this one, it was really <laughs> about, yeah, it was about, about the associations and the, ah, the echo echoes of things i think yeah yeah we have another question now um would you consider a film using archival footage from more recent indian history oh yeah i mean i, I i'd love to work with indian archives i had tried to go i tried to go um to the indian Arch archives of my film i for india um and had seen some wonderful stuff but indian archives you know have you know are not in the same state of do not have the same state of support as British archives do. So mm. you know it was quite difficult yeah. to do that. But I love. I mean, archive is my big documentary passion, and I think I think you know I'm not 
I think I'm the type of filmmaker that would always want to come back to archive in my documentaries yeah. because I just, there's so, you know, for me, the joy of documentary is, is development over time. Mm. And if I'm not the type of filmmaker who's going to spend 10 years filming somebody, um, then I think archive is, is, is probably where my home is in documentary. I see. Um, uh, to answer the questions about uh, seeing the film, if you haven't seen the film yet, you can access it from our website. Uh, uh, there's a promo code Smithsonian that you use when you go to the website of the film. I know it asks you to rent it for $4.99, but if you click that button, there'll be a place where you can enter a promo code and it's free uh, for the rest of the month. So uh, feel free to do that. Um, another question for you. Uh, do you think people are also interested in documentaries about the India of today? Would you give a few examples if any exist? Oh, I think Indian documentary is, is you know, is thriving. Um, the problem is you don't get to see that many of them. Um, I'm trying to think of good Indian documentaries recently. I'll have to come back to you on that one because I just... <laughs> um, by Indian filmmaker. I mean, that, you see, some, one of my favorite documentaries is a very, it's a very old documentary, but it's a beautiful Indian documentary. It's called, um, it's probably one of my, all-time favorite documentaries. It's called Diamond in the Vegetable Market. Hmm. I don't know that one. Uh, which is a stunning, really stunning film. Um, but yeah, I think, I think documentary makers are, are busy in India as they are everywhere. Definitely, yeah. Well, I, uh, before we conclude things here, but if anyone has any more questions, please do add them to the chat. I've just added my own little con contribution to the chat, a survey, which we'd love for you all to fill out uh, after you go to give us your thoughts about how we did today. But uh, does anyone have any more questions? Well, I guess not. Well, thank you for taking the time, Sanja, to speak to us and best of luck. Um, I don't know, obviously none of us know what's going to happen with the film industry and I know you were planning a film, um, but I hope that that does work out and we all get back to normal sometime soon. But uh, thank you so much for being with us today and thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>